G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy for the round three edition of the AFL Come Down. We're obviously discussing all the action that took place in round three, giving you some of my general thoughts, but of course, you guys have left some comments as well in the community tab that are going to be featured in this video. And as far as I'm aware, we've got comments on every game that took place, which is great. So let's get into it. It's odd with Easter weekend. Obviously, there's games spanning from Thursday to Monday. And as a result, like looking back at the Brisbane Collingwood game that took place on Easter Thursday, that feels like a long time ago. But anyway, Collingwood came out and made a, uh, you know, a big statement. This was obviously a battle between two winless sides from last year's grand final and it was really important um, for rescuing seasons rather than necessarily making big statements. That being said, I think Collingwood did make a statement that their pressure throughout this game was far improved. It was even first half, I think the Lions were up by five points at half time. Collingwood then opened up the game with a five goal to one third term and uh, it, what was really evident as well was just the in intensity from the outset. This was more like the Collingwood we had become somewhat accustomed to over the last couple of years and its tackle count was 85 to 53. In terms of individuals, like Dacos went back to halfback and 30 touches, 7 score involvements. Jamie Elliott in particular, I think, typified the intensity lift. He kicked four goals himself and uh, there, was a, there was a really good tackle he laid that won a free kick. The Lions are a pretty strong clearance side. They won the clearances again in this game, but it was on the turnover where the Pies really exposed them. And this is becoming a common trend throughout the AFL. And that's where we'll get to the comments. The first one is one of our members, Wades, who says, clearance footy is dead. And then he also says, Brisbane's top two chances, probably their top four chances, are also dead. So it's absolutely true. Like Trying to analyze this round of footy and what has been a common thread has been teams scoring from turnover and dominating games and teams that win clearances aren't necessarily translating that to scores on the board. Whether clearance footy is dead, I'm not sure if I'd go that far. I do think towards the end of the season when, when finals come around, I do think we'll see a shift. I feel like that's happened in the past where clearance, contests, these things will be more important. But there's no doubt at the moment, there's not a big correlation between winning clearances and winning games. As for Brisbane's top two chances, I would agree that they're dead, possibly their top four as well. Is the team dead? I don't think think so. Obviously, things aren't going right at the moment. There's talk. You know, there's this whole off-field story. They are definitely in a hole. I, I'm not writing them off. I, I think they're in a position where they could try and resurrect their season. And if they do scrape back into finals, you know, I think they're, they're such a good team that it, they could shake things up from outside the four. But it is much harder to win a flag from outside the four. So they're not in a good spot, that's for sure. J-Man says the Pies are back and will finish top four after a slow start to the season. I wouldn't rule it out, but I still think being one and three at the moment makes it very hard to, to finish in the top four. I think five to eight is still well and truly on. They could be back. It's been one game, but uh, obviously we saw them revert back to, to the team we sort of expected to see this year. So both of these sides have uh, bottom three sides as opponents, I think, in gather round. The Pies have got the Hawks, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, Brisbane play North Melbourne. So really good opportunities for these guys to get back a little bit of momentum. Max Hansen points out that Gabba has lost its fortress status. They'll still win plenty of games at home but the fortress has been breached absolutely no doubt about that i mean brisbane have lost more games at the gabba in 2024 than they did over the entire 2022 and 2023 seasons good opposition for sure but there's no doubt they're not playing very well Let's move to Good Friday when North took on Carlton and uh, were bested by 56 points. I think Carlton just flexed their muscles in this game. Too strong in the midfield, certainly cleaner. And, you know, one, like, on-paper deficiency that North had going into this year, there is absolutely no doubt about it, was their tall defensive situation. And as a result, Carlton, with two of the best forwards in the game in Kurnow and Mackay, they kicked nine goals between them. Mackay's in all-Australian form. But on the whole, you know, Carlton, Carlton were too good, and we, we kind of expect that, though. As for other points that I'll point out, I mean... Uh, uh, Elijah Hollands, I think it was his first game for Carlton, kicked a goal, 22 touches, five tackles, really solid output from a former high draft pick that's battled with injury, hasn't really been able to break into Gold Coast side, so um, you know I thought that was really positive to see him into the side and also contribute straight away. Coleman Jones also did his Achilles, I think. Is that That's the second player that North have lost to an Achilles injury in, in the fortnight, I think. What the hell is with that? That is so unfortunate. Hopefully he, uh, you know... Hopefully he gets back as soon as possible. Just the one comment from this game. Play on footy says the Roos got bullied, but they have some exciting youth. Yeah, absolutely agree with that. In particular, point out a couple of strong performances from youth. There's probably more than what I'm pointing out here, but I thought it's really positive that Tom Powell backed up his previous week with a really strong performance again. 29 touches and six clearances. Got him into my fantasy as a forward. Great move by me. Pat myself on the back for that. Um, and also Wardlaw had seven clearances. Again, I think Wardlaw's next evolution will just be sort of a little bit like Matthew Rowe. Over time, we'll start winning a bit more outside ball, but seven clearances is 
great for his age. Then we'll go to Optus Stadium where Fremantle were far too good for Adelaide. Much was said about this game in terms of how bad it was, um, specifically the skills. You know, um, The skill execution from both teams wasn't particularly great, but make no mistake, Fremantle was far better than Adelaide. For the Crows, I thought their pressure was good, but it wasn't. there was no midfield forward line connection. You know, I think the midfield game was solid. I think a lot has been said about their midfielders, and I will address that in a moment because we've got some comments on that. But yeah, to score 34 points in a game, uh, <laughs> what are you, West Coast? For Frio, you know, I thought individuals, Michael Walters was great. Jordan Clark as well, I think, is having a bit of an underrated season. He's still getting the recognition from Freo fans, not so much anywhere else yet, but 26 touches and seven marks in this game, and that is also his averages for the year. Alex Pierce as well has been talked about in the media. I thought he was really, really good. So we're a Fremantle at the moment. The three wins, zero losses. You can only beat the teams ahead of you. It is worth noting that none of their opponents have won a single game yet, but I don't think that's necessarily a mark against Fremantle. I think we're seeing progress, and what will happen, I think, is if they start accumulating these wins, sure, this was a scratchy performance in terms of skill execution, but a lot's going right. They've got some top-end talent now. Luke Jackson and Caleb Sarong are certainly in the elite category. I think they can improve on this baseline, and it's really positive for them that they're 3-0. So we'll get to the comments. To Samantha Jane Rose, member of the channel, says, not sure I trust the Dockers quite enough just yet. It's a long season, but I am largely liking what I've seen. They seem to have genuine belief that despite not winning an opening quarter yet, that they can get the game back on their terms with persistence. That's a very good point. Yeah, they haven't uh, had a really good start to a game yet. They've had to come from behind in all of their games, which I think is a good good sign of, of a side with character and a little bit of belief as well. So like I said, they can progress from there. Then Billy Chook says, Fremantle's a top four team. I don't agree with this yet, but they do have Carlton next week in Gather the Round. If they win that, then uh, I'll start to believe that top four is absolutely possible. Evan 08 says, there are some serious issues inside the close, Crows club rooms. I can't speak to that. I have absolutely no idea, but there's no doubt they are not playing what their talent level would suggest, which can indicate something wrong a little bit internally. Yitz also points out the Crouch and Laird combo isn't working. Unfortunately, Nix doesn't have the balls to change anything. There needs to be some serious changes. Half the team thinks they're too good for the Sandfall. Jones and Fogarty need to be dropped. Pedler should be sent back to the Sandfall to gain some confidence. So many midfield talents have been wasted away at half forward. So I presume a frustrated Adelaide Crows fan, and I can understand that. As for Laird and, and Crouch, yeah, it's a tough one because statistically, like, they're, they're doing okay. But it seems to be like as soon as the ball leaves the clearance situation, I'm seeing this at West Coast as well. On the inside, it's fine. It's what happens when it gets to the outside. And that's where these slower types will get exposed if you have too many in the team. As for Pedler, yeah, he, he's still super young in terms of his you know, AFL career and, and transitioning into a midfielder. They've got a few types like that that I think could move into becoming more permanent midfielders in the future. It's just a little bit early for Pedler. So we'll see. Whether he needs to be dropped to the sandfall, I'm, I'm not too sure. But I still think he probably does become a midfielder in time. Let's talk about Essendon and St Kilda. And uh, this one was a bit of an upset. I did have a funny feeling that Essendon was going to win this game. And I couldn't work out why until I watched, uh, I think it was Cardman's video talking about, forgive me if it wasn't Cardman, it might have actually been Saints TV, uh, talking about how Essendon had a good record against St Kilda at Marvel Stadium. And I was like, why Why do I feel like Essendon could win this game? And sure enough, they did. Bit of a scrappy low scoring game for sure. I felt like Essendon couldn't quite get their ball through St Kilda's zone for large points of the game. And as a result, either their skills were worse or they were made to look worse by good defensive positioning. And then in the last quarter, they managed to move the ball a lot more precise, maybe in the last 15 minutes, but they still scored two goals, six to one goal one. So good win, absolutely good win. Zach Merritt, enormous in the last quarter, 12 touches. Nick Martin was enormous from the outset with 44. He had 27 at half time. We'll get to the comments because there's a few. AFL Snap says, Essendon being down for the whole game into the last five minutes. Yes, that is, uh, that is quite funny. Nothing better than when you win games like that. Um, I remember one for the Eagles in 2018. Can't remember exactly what it was, but it definitely happened. Play on footy says the Saints missed Henry and King. Probably true. You take out Max King, he, he might have been the difference here, but you still got to give credit for Essendon. They were two and one to start this season. Their one loss was a very respectable one. They should be pretty pleased with where they're at. Du Bois says the Saints and the Dons are going to fall off hard by mid-season. That game was a battle of the uglier performance. Yeah, it wasn't the biggest illustration of footballing skills, but I do think that might just be a product of the way St. Kilda set up defensively, and it's okay early in the season if skills are a little bit scrappier. Could they fall off hard by mid-season? We are talking about two teams over the last couple of years that have struggled to run out seasons. Essendon was you know, poor in the last couple of months last year, and St. Kilda as well over the last two years have been a much better side at the start than they were at the end. So I'm not going to predict that it's going to happen again, 
but it's worth mentioning. User BE2, sorry, I can't see the proper um, username here. For some reason, YouTube is now giving everyone two usernames. But anyway, my biggest takeaway is don't trust St. Kilda. I couldn't decide who to tip between the Saints and the Bombers because I don't trust either, but I went with St. Kilda. And like always, they were the letdown. I'd hate to go for that team. So firing some shots. I, I, I don't know if I, I would say that about St. Kilda. I do think there has been a bit of a lack of trust with the way they run out seasons. But again, you know, I thought they were in a good position to win this game. I don't think it's the end of the world that they lost it. Maybe they're playing Essendon at a bad time. Who knows? Nonetheless, they'll be really disappointed because they had set up for a really good start to the season, win over Collingwood last week. This will feel like a missed opportunity, and it was. Port Adelaide versus Melbourne, game of the round potentially, where the Ds got up by seven points. It was a really good game, actually, and I think pretty good litmus test, but I think we learned that both teams are going to be good this year. And funny, funny game to analyze statistically, like Port Adelaide, 28 shots on goal. Not only that, they had 66 inside 50s to 45. They won the clearance battle 52 to 37. Not only that, but their tackles inside 50, they won 20 to 9. So these are all indicators of a pretty healthy win. And yet the Demons were able to prevail. They managed to respond every time Port Adelaide got on top and kicked big set shot goals. And that was ultimately the difference between the two sides. So I think the reading on this game is that both teams are going to be good this year. Melbourne, this is a great test for them to have passed. They're looking in fantastic shape. And we'll get to some comments because they, they address this. Doggy Doug says Melbourne are just about flag favorites. Maybe. Maybe. They're certainly in that conversation. Again, it's a little bit early. I mean, GWS and Sydney. Sydney lost this weekend, obviously, and GWS didn't play. But Melbourne are looking, you know, as good as any. To, to beat Port Adelaide in Adelaide is a really good tick. Wade says Melbourne has to pray for Max Gorn to stay healthy all year. So I'll point out that Gorn had 50 hitouts and 28 disposals. Can they win without him? I think they've got enough talent to win games without him. But he is also an elite ruckman. So naturally, you would be praying for him to stay fit. Blease JC says goal kicking is the only thing keeping Port from a flag. Big call. I wouldn't say it was as simple as that, but obviously it has been pretty poor. Henry Winspear says Melbourne's culture was questioned and they want to prove everyone wrong. They look like they have the same hunger they did in 2021. It could just be that they are starting the season well like they historically do, but their pressure on Port Adelaide was through the roof. I agree. They're looking like a very united team at the moment. Like I said in the like in the preseason, like sometimes this outside noise can either ruin a club or it can galvanize them. And so far what we've seen from Melbourne, save for their opening round loss, has they look pretty galvanized to me. And play on footy also chimes in with Melbourne are on something good, unbelievable game against Port. Agreed. Great game of footy and Melbourne are in good shape. Then we had an Easter Sunday battle for the ages between the Western Bulldogs and the West Coast Eagles. An absolute thriller. Bulldogs winning by 76 points. Um, you know, again, not so much to analyse here. We sort of saw this coming, but Trelaw was really good. 35 touches and a goal. Bonds and Pelly kind of struggled to get his hands on the footy. I'm not too sure actually where um, he was playing, but he did kick three goals as well. So still tunned up for my fantasy team. Um, but yeah, interesting game in terms of um, some key stats. And this probably speaks to the turnover game versus clearance game because inside 50s were even. West Coast won the clearance battle and yet this game wasn't even close. Plastic said, I believe before the game, don't even need to watch West Coast versus Western Bulldogs to know what the takeaways will be from that matchup. And then in and out and back in says, I'm regretting buying Eagles tickets. Yes, I, I, I get that. Bulldogs look slick. I'll, I'll give them credit for a very intense performance in terms of pressure. Like it didn't really let up from quarter to quarter and you could be forgiven for them slacking off for like half a quarter in this game, given how one-sided it was, but they didn't, and they made it very tough for West Coast. In addition to that, West Coast left a few goals on the board just by some really bad skill execution. Expected score was about 56, and what did they end up kicking? Three goals, 12? That's pretty much all you need to know. It felt like whenever West Coast got the ball in a good position, they'd fumble and probably get a little bit too excited, but either way, schooled by a much better team. Richmond versus Sydney. This is almost the win of the round, I reckon. Richmond getting the job done over the Swans at the MCG. I think Richmond are worthy of a heap of praise for the way they've started this season. I highlighted them as a team with an okay best 22 that relied a lot on their best players, and if those players got injured, they would struggle. Their injury list at the moment includes Prestia, Hopper, Jack Graham, Josh Gibkiss, who is not a key player yet, still is obviously someone they want to get into their team. And after this game, they've lost Lynch, who missed the footy to start the year anyway, and Bolter as well. And yet, they are playing like a really desperate and galvanized and motivated football team. And I look at that as a West Coast fan right now, and I'm envious, like full credit to them. The vulnerability will be if, if the injuries continue, I would worry for them in a sense, because it's hard to sustain that when you're so many soldiers down. But on what we've seen so far, they look fantastic. 
Taranto was great. He had eight clearances. Bolton, 25-2. and two. We know these guys are good, but there's also a lot of role players who came in and did well. Like Lafau kicked two goals from his two opportunities. And that Mansell guy as well, 17 touches a goal and six tackles. Just typical of a youngster without a profile coming in, getting the job done. There's a lot to be learned of from this game that West Coast should be looking at, and they probably will be watching this thing as we play Sydney next week. For the Swans, I mean, Heaney was good again. What do you have, 27 touches and a couple of goals, I think it was? But James Rowbottom, like, we saw some footage of that, I think, on the couch. And the intensity of this guy, how hard he works, was unreal. So credit where it's due to him as well, even though they lost 13 tackles once again, underrated gun. Dublou says Sydney brought down to earth potentially caught napping by a side playing like they've got a lot to play for. So respect. I think this is a blip on the radar. They're still a good team. Nonetheless, a little bit of a reality check for sure. And finally, we've got the Easter Monday clash between Hawthorne and Geelong with the weird lightning delay. Uh, Max Hansen says, if I had a dollar for every time the AFL game was delayed by lightning in the past three years, I would have $2, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it's happened twice. Yeah, true. We went a long time without seeing it. I do remember a final between Sydney and West Coast in 2004, where they nearly called the game off at half time. And the other one involved West Coast too. That was Melbourne and West Coast at Optus Stadium. I was at that game. It is kind of weird. But anyway, enough about that. Um, this game, yeah, it was kind of weird. Topsy-turvy. Geelong nearly ended the game at quarter time with six goals to one. Tanner Braun had 15 touches at quarter time. He ended up having 27, possibly his best game at AFL level. But to the Hawks' credit, they fought back really well and it was pretty close at halftime from memory. I think they were a goal or two down. Then they fell away again and then came back a little bit and ultimately lost by six goals, which I think is a respectable loss. James Warple, I think, was statistically the best player this round. 35 touches, six clearances, eight tackles, unreal performance. And for the Cats, Hawkins kicked four goals in his 350th. Henry kicked four goals as as well at the end of the day they'll just be happy that they get through this game with a win and no injuries after you know a rain delay like that or a lightning delay i should say obviously the older the list the more vulnerable they are to coming back out and potentially getting injured so all in all this game more or less went to how we'd expected if anything hawthorne probably got a little bit closer than i expected a few general comments from you guys to finish off this video samantha jane rose says i think we are seeing a few standouts start to establish and trench themselves in the top eight yeah they're like who are the best performed team so far carlton melbourne i'd give Port Adelaide that credit to in the Sioux Sydney sides. Then there's a few teams behind that still proving themselves. Fremantle have won three games, but probably need to prove it against some better teams. St Kilda, really good start to the season, then a blip on the radar against Essendon. So it's starting to take shape and hopefully Gather Round will be quite revealing once again. She also says, is it just me? Or is it, does it feel like the number of players suffering severe injuries like ACLs has increased this year? Just at a glance, it feels like we've had an awful lot of them so early in the season. I don't know what the stats are on this, but I have noticed that too. And like I said, two Achilles injuries to North players. Like, What are the odds of that? Achilles injuries are quite rare. Is there a reason for it? I'm not too sure. Like, I, I'm, That's not really my area. The game in theory is more deba- demanding than it's ever been. Does that necessarily lead to more ACLs? It could be a statistical anomaly, but I have felt like there has been a bunch. You know, what do we have? Two in open round shocking stuff shocking stuff chuck rose says the players need to hone their basic skills as a general comment on this round this is true this is true i do think that over time you will see skills improve as the season goes on you know as they get more accustomed to playing under match pressure round one games are usually scrappy we're still only in round three and which you know is technically round four but most teams haven't played four games so hopefully that will improve but it's definitely true of my club and you know other clubs as well Anyway, guys, that is the football come down for round three. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for all the contributions this week. Thank you for being subscribed and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.